All right, Mac. All good. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Mac Burnham, a co-director of Uplink, uh, and I'll be the moderator of this session. Today, we're going to be hearing about managing behavior issues in pediatric epilepsy, in other words, in kids with seizures. Our speakers will be uh, Dr. Mary Lou Smith, Heather Olivieri, and uh, Christy Nyland Burns. After the talks today, we'll have a question and answer session, uh, and people are invited to submit their questions into the Zoom chat box. Uh, when you have a question, please let us know which presenter you are directing the question to. Please also note that the webinar is being recorded. Uh, feel free to turn your camera off if you have any concerns uh, regarding privacy. Okay, with that, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Mary Lou Smith, a neuropsychologist at the Hospital for Sick Children, one of our EpLink researchers, and a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto. Mary, uh, Mary Lou. Thank you, Mac. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. I've been asked to start off these proceedings by talking a little bit about the brain and how it relates to behavior and to present a bit of the research on behavior disorders in children with epilepsy. So let's start with the brain part. So this diagram shows the four lobes of the brain. This showing the left side of the brain or the left hemisphere. And these lobes are the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. Of course, underlying these lobes or buried beneath them, there are other key structures, and I'll talk about some of those in a moment. Now, with respect to behavior and the brain, one of the key areas that has been recognized is that of the frontal lobe. So many of you may be familiar with the concept of executive functioning and that being part of the frontal lobe. And executive functioning includes a variety of aspects of behavior, which are listed here on the slide. And some of these are cognitively related like planning and problem solving, but there are also features of frontal lobe or executive function that can di directly relate to behavior, such as motivation, your judgment about what to do in particular situations, your impulse control, aspects of your social behavior and your personality. So when we have disorders involving the frontal lobe, whether they be epilepsy or other disorders, then these aspects of executive functioning can be impaired and may result in behavior disorders. Another key aspect to behavior is the ability to regulate your emotions when you feel when it's appropriate to express happiness, when it's appropriate to express anger and how much anger and how you express it and so on. And these aspects of emotional regulation are subserved by the limbic system, which has many different structures and they're shown here. And these are beneath the cortex. It's sort of buried within those um, lobes that I showed you in the previous um, slides. Um, so one um, structure that you might particularly hear about is the amygdala, which is very, very important for emotion um, regulation. So again, when there's um, dysfunction in the amygdala or any of these other aspects of the limbic system, you may have, this may translate into difficulty regulating behavior. Now, I want to point out that we now think of epilepsy as being what we call a network disorder. So even though a seizure may start in one particular part of the brain, so for example, here we see this lesion, this dysfunctional area here in the frontal lobe, and um, that may cause seizures um, and that um, affect other areas of the frontal lobe as shown here. But remember that each of those areas also can be connected to different parts of the brain. Um, this function can propagate or spread to other parts of the brain. So even though an individual may have seizures arising from a particular focal area, many parts of the brain or the functioning of many parts of the brain can be involved. And that is perhaps why um, psychiatric or behavioral problems are quite common in children with epilepsy. 
And epidemiological studies have shown that between 35 to 50% of children or adolescents with epilepsy can have behavior problems. And these can greatly affect the quality of life of the children themselves and also of their um, families. And we, I'm sure we'll get into this discussion, but in many cases, these problems create more of a challenge in management than the management of the seizures themselves. Now, when we look at the research that has identified factors that influence the psychological status of the child, we see that it is quite um, complex. So when we look at um, many aspects of the child, the co their child's cognition, their psychological performance, family functioning, their intrinsic factors like genetics, um, the developmental aspects of the epilepsy itself. A number of um, factors have been identified that feed into the final presentation that the child makes. So it's quite a complex situation from the research perspective. Now, one thing that's important to um, think about or one thing that has been thought about is whether the behavioral problems or emotional problems, psychological disorders that we see with epilepsy, are they what we call the essential comorbidities of epilepsy or are they the effects of having seizures or of or taking medications? So we know that, uh, let's start with a person um, who has a dysfunction in a particular part of the brain. It might be an abnormality, it might be a neurochemical dysfunction. And that, that gives rise to different symptoms. One of the symptoms is seizures, but it may also give rise to depression, anxiety, or other psychological disorders, or it may give rise to behavioral, overt behavioral disorders such as aggression, ADHD, and so on. So these are symptoms of the brain dysfunction as much as the seizures are symptoms. So they're caused by the same underlying problem in the brain. But then having seizures itself may lead to difficulties in these areas. So people may say, oh, um, this is, uh, seizures are very difficult, they interfere with my life and I feel depressed. I feel anxious that I might have a seizure in the classroom or I might act out because I'm angry that I have um, seizures. And finally, we have to think about the anti-seizure medications, which obviously we uh, children take because we hope that they will um, stop the seizures. But the seizure, the anti-seizure medications may have side effects that result in psychological or behavioral disorders. Sometimes these are negative side effects, but they can also be positive. Sometimes these medications have what we call um, psychotropic or positive benefits as well. Now, what's important to recognize is that the underlying brain abnormality may be more important than the seizures themselves in causing these behavior disorders. And we know this because there's a lot of research now that indicates that behavioral abnormalities may even precede the onset of the epilepsy, just like the brain disorder precedes the onset of the epilepsy. And we also know that when seizures stop, the behavior disorders may persist. So they're not caused by the seizures themselves. So just to give you an example of that, here's some, some results from a study done a number of years ago um, in children with um, new or recent onset epilepsy. And at the time that they were diagnosed with epilepsy, um, between um, 13 to 23% had depressive disorders, a large number had anxiety disorders. ADHD was present in between 17 to 30% of them and so on. So you can see from these results that even before the seizures began, began these children were exhibiting behavior problems. Just to my point about um, the fact that when you stop seizures, the behavior problems may persist. So you can't blame all those behavior problems on the seizures themselves. Here are some data from the Great Ormond Street Hospital, the Children's Hospital in London, England. And these were children who had temporal lobe epilepsy and underwent surgery. So this is their results prior to surgery and then after surgery in a group that stopped having seizures. And this is the percentage who had psychiatric diagnosis, pervasive developmental disorders, attention deficit disorders, oppositional defiant or cognitive disorders, emotional disorders, and so on. 
And you can see that there's been very little change from preoperative to postoperative. So when a child had a behavior problem or an emotional problem, it tended to persist after the surgery, even though the seizures had stopped. And in the case of emotional disorders, there were even some new onset of emotional disorders that hadn't existed um, prior to uh, surgery. I want to talk a little bit about um, this uh, relatively recent study, uh, again, of children in new onset or recent onset epilepsy. And this is um, based on parent report of behavior. And um, in this study, they had 183 children with epilepsy and 107 controls who were actually cousins. Um, and none of the children with epilepsy had intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. And that's important because um, behavior problems are much higher in children with intellectual disability or autism spectrum disorder. So the presence of those diagnoses is a risk factor for behavior problems. But nonetheless, you can see here that the children with epilepsy shown in green, green had much higher behavior problems than the controls across the board, anxiety, depression, with wrong behaviors, somatic complaints, social problems, thought problems, attention problems, rule-breaking behaviors, and aggression. But what was interesting in, in this study is that it began to parse out who has behavior problems and who doesn't. And um, they used a statistical um, technique to try to um, identify groups of children. So again, we can see here this purple bar down here, line is the controls. And they identified three clusters within the group of children with epilepsy. One cluster shown in green didn't differ from the controls at all. They didn't have any behavior problems. The cluster in orange had um, elevated problems in some areas, anxiety, depression, somatic complaints. But in other areas, like acting out kinds of behavior problems, they were just like the controls. They didn't have difficulties. And then there was the third cluster shown in blue, who across the board had problems in all of these domains. So they asked the question, well, in what way did this blue cluster, cluster three, differ from the others? Why were these children having so much difficulty? Well, one thing was that they had a lot more cognitive problems. So these um, results show um, the uh, test results from various aspects of verbal processing, perceptual processing, assessing attention, executive function, and speed of processing. And the lower the bar is below the zero, the greater the problem. So you can see that it was cluster three, the children with behavior problems who had more cognitive difficulties. And they also did um, MRI scans and they found that those children in this um, cluster three, the ones who had the most behavior problems were those who had decreased cortical thickness. And that was um, shown in a number of areas in the brain, in the um, frontal, temporal, parietal and occipital lobes. So I wanted just to mention um, and come back to mentioning anti um, seizure medications. And um, uh, this table shows um, drugs um, according to when they were developed, whether the, they were what we call the older AEDs, anti epileptic drugs, newer ones, or the newest of all. And you can see that a number of them come with cautions that could possibly result in behavioral side effects. Now, keep in mind that not everybody has a negative side effect from a drug. But if you're going to have a side effect, they could be seen with these drugs. And also some of these drugs have positive behavioral effects like lamotrigine actually can improve some aspects of behavior in children with um, epilepsy. So in thinking about whether or not uh, behavior disorders are related to um, medications, one has to think about the kind of medication the child is on. And I'm just gonna end with a little um, promotion. Um, this was an Eplink project to develop a teacher toolkit. It is available for free at this website. It was a um, collaborative effort between psychologists and the uh, Southwestern um, Ontario Epilepsy Society. 
and we've produced a video to um, inform teachers about the comorbidities of epilepsy, as well as down free downloadable um, toolkits or booklets on the different consequences of epilepsy. And there is one on the psychological consequences of epilepsy, which does give some tips for management of behavior in the classroom. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mary Lou. Our next presenter will be Heather Olivieri. Heather is a social worker at the Hospital for Sick Children. Heather? Thanks very much, uh, Mac. Um, I'm just going to... was working before we started but do you see do you see it full screen or do you see the Heather you have to I think click on your slide logo at the bottom okay no no go to the right the one at the far right this one yeah uh, this one. oh that one no uh, no uh, that one hmm. sorry I don't know then let sorry. me just try one more thing here oh. There we go. Start again. It was it was all set up, and then I think it might have uh, might have timed out. Sorry, everybody. Um, there we go. I think we're good. So uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, uh, and this could be a whole course, but how to ma uh, manage challenging behavior in uh, children and youth with um, with epilepsy. I think a really good place to start is with the iceberg analogy. So everybody knows that, you know, with an iceberg, there's the ice that you see above the surface, and then uh, there is sort of all of the matter that uh, exists below the surface. And I think uh, when we're talking about childhood behavior, that's really useful analogy because uh, there's the behaviors that we see and we deal with every day, and then there's the pieces that are the meaning behind the behaviors, um, the potential triggers for behaviors, um, and some of the factors. Uh, and um, uh, with epilepsy, as we heard from Mary Lou, there's many factors underlying the behaviors. And so I think that's really important to think about when we're uh, thinking about how to address those behaviors. Um, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because Mary Lou did a really great job, but um, you know, I kind of think about epilepsy as like the perfect storm for challenging behavior. So the perfect storm is that kind of co-occurrence of factors that creates this enormous storm. And I think epilepsy is like that in some ways. So we see many children struggle with sort of the fear and unpredictability uh, that's imposed by seizures, uh, the stigma and social isolation that impacts their social relationships, and all of the neurobiological factors that Mary Lou went into, the abnormal electrical uh, activity in terms of the firing of neurons, both during seizures and in between seizures, underlying brain abnormalities that might not, not even be known unless you look at them under a microscope, um, and the way that the anticonvulsant medications potentially um, impact with um, or, or interact with brain chemicals that um, promote uh, uh, regulation. I was trying to think about where to best focus this talk today. And I think uh, in terms of the, uh, one of the, the things that sort of uh, connects or uh, common threads with a lot of the behavioral issues that we see is self-regulation. And self-regulation is really defined as our ability to monitor, manage our energy states, thoughts, emotions, behaviors in accordance with the demands of the situation. And with many young people with complex brains and epilepsy is no exception, we see that uh, often the skills in terms of self-regulation are lagging. And I think that that's a really important thing to remember from today's talk is that um, this is um, uh, these are skills that are lagging uh, and it's important that we find ways to help young people build these skills in better ways um, um, when we're uh, thinking about addressing behaviors. A really good analogy uh, that I like for self-regulation is uh, the car analogy. So when we're learning to drive a car, if we need to drive a car at the right speed, we need to figure out how to operate the accelerator in the right way, the gears in the right way, um, uh, when to brake, we need to adjust to the, uh, the demands of the given driving scenario, whether that's weather or incline or those kinds of things. And I think that when young people are learning to 
to regulate themselves, it's really not that much different than, um, than the car analogy. So we've got some young people that might be pushing too hard on the accelerator and they're going at hyper speed. We've got um, other people that might be um, going too slow um, and, uh, and others that are kind of um, finding the spot where it's just right. And if we think about uh, behavior as we want to maintain sort of that optimum speed, that optimum level of engagement and attention um, in spite of all of the um, uh, the stimuli, the stressors, the demands that are happening, that's a really complicated skill to build. And so I'm hoping that all of the caregivers that are listening today can kind of um, can remember that and leaving today that this is a really complicated skill at the best of times. And for children with epilepsy, it's, it can be even more challenging. I also like this car analogy because I think it's a really good way to talk to um, uh, to kids about their own states. Um, and so this idea that you can, as the graphic on the right shows, you can kind of check with them, like, how's your engine running right now? Are we going too slow? Like the, the poor purple car on the left there, you know, is your body really tired? Are you slumped posture, just not able to get up and get going? And we know that fatigue is a, a very significant factor for many young people with seizures. Are you going just right where your attention is at the right speed, you're ready to listen and engage? Or are you going too fast um, or too, uh, too, too intense of a rate? So um, uh, are you, is your energy too high? Are you fidgety? Uh, is your voice too loud? Um, so just so that um, young people can begin to tune into the different states uh, and figure out um, the strategies that they need to, um, to readjust. What do these um, uh, self-regulation difficulties look like? And young people. Um, Mary Lou touched on some of this, but what I hear from parents is it often looks like big reactions to small problems, getting stuck, so on ideas, being able to change, uh, uh, adapt to change, um, trouble moving on from things, that social skills might be less effective, they may have emotional lability, so a lot of swinging between different um, kind of intensity of emotion, inattention, impulsivity, difficulty seeing perspectives of others, uh, um, and um, as Mary Lou said, increased rates of anxiety and depression. So how do we help with this? Well, the way that I like to think about this is we, we need to teach these skills. Uh, and there are some strategies that we can use to help promote self-regulation in young people that help to um, uh, essentially re rewire their brains or to um, help um, uh, you know, in terms of those areas of their brains that, are, um, uh, that support self-regulation. So kind of building new pathways and new networks. And uh, so now I'm gonna talk about a few strategies that, uh, that can help support with that. So the first one is something called co-regulation. So co-regulation is uh, like bringing calm to the storm. So you see sort of on the left there that ship in rocky waters and that's sort of like the young person who's really activated or agitated. And so as the adults, whether it's um, parents, grandparents, care other caregivers, educators, um, our responsibility in those moments or what we can really do to help is we can bring calm to the situation. I know that is not always easy, but there's, there's reasons, really good neurobiological reasons why this is important. So um, uh, we know that um, all people have uh, certain kinds of brain cells or neurons called mirror neurons. And those mirror neurons uh, pick up um, uh, the input from other people around us. And so when a young person is really activated, if the person that's with them is reflecting some calm, they begin to pick, to pick up on that. It, it's not that they necessarily are going to calm immediately in that moment, but often it actually helps to prevent further escalation. And eventually um, they, um, the things that are potentially ag agitating them or trigger them um, are going to, uh, going to improve. So here are some strategies or some examples of how to um, introduce co-regulation or, or better co-regulation. So the first one is um, uh, labeling, uh, labeling emotions. So uh, things like uh, that was really, that looked really frustrating for you when that other um, uh, person took the, took the swing when you wanted to swing. Um, I could see you were sad when uh, this happened. So really helping to build an emotion vocabulary. I think bringing calm in your presence. So uh, listening, I always say to parents, less talking is better, especially when kids are really, really activated because they're often not processing anyway, that good kind of thinking decision-making part of their brain isn't online. And so being uh, comforting with your presence, making eye contact, getting down to their level. 
Uh, breathing is an amazing way. Breathing with your child is an amazing way to co-regulate. There's lots of different examples of really cool breathing exercises online. I just put an example there of something called triangle breathing, which is you essentially trace the triangle and follow the instructions. So breathing in for three, holding for three, breathing out for three. And if your child can, can tolerate actual touch during the times when they're activated, you can actually trace the triangle on their hand with them, or you can trace it on their back um, while you're breathing. Uh, and creating a calm down corner can be really helpful. Some, um, some of you uh, children youth might already have uh, this available in the classroom or in your home, but the idea is creating a space where there's low stimulation, um, a comfortable space where they can go and chill out and just um, uh, you know, bring themselves down to a calmer level. You might have things like books or stuffies or other things that uh, provide comfort in those moments. These are things that can really help with that. Uh, the other thing that's important is really trying to think about what are some of the things underlying the behavior, sort of the bottom part of the iceberg that's under the water. Um, and um, selfreg.ca, uh, the Merit Center, is a great source for um, all kinds of resources around self-regulation. But some of the factors that they talk about are the biological factors, so crowds, too much visual stimulation, not enough exercise, uh, emotional factors, so being really sensitive to those um, uh, strong emotions, so being overexcited or being angry or afraid, uh, difficulties processing information, and social difficulties, so picking up on cues, not being able to track what's happening in social interactions, or really being sensitive to the stress of others around them. Uh, and lastly, we find that with a lot of the children and youth who have epilepsy, that they, um, they either struggle with identifying uh, and expressing and labeling their feelings, or recognizing the feelings in the body and, and um, that the feelings are escalating. So some of those transitions or um, uh, escalation and de-escalation of different emotion states. And so one of the things that I recommend is um, becoming a feelings detective. And um, that's the way that I talk with kids about it, but really what it is is trying to develop a vocabulary of feelings. You can do that through stories, you can do that through games. So like um, freeze, um, free, um, uh, you know, you can do the, uh, freeze game, Simon says, where you have to stop and uh, model an emotion or freeze um, uh, or uh, emotion charades or while you're reading stories, actually stopping during the story and asking your child how they are, how they think the character might be feeling. Also labeling your own emotions, being human. So, you know, you're doing, uh, you're doing the dishes and, you know, uh, you know, something happens to frustrate you and you say, oh, I'm feeling really frustrated about that, but I'm going to take a few deep breaths and then I'm going to keep going. So modeling that really um, adaptive way of coping. I also really like the, um, the zones of regulation program. Uh, schools use this a lot, but I think it can be adapted for home use as well. And what this program does is it uses, um, uh, it, it sort of um, divides attention and emotion states into different colored zones. So the blue would be sort of the um, more moving slowly, more down. The green would be more focused, calm, happy, uh, able to listen. The yellow zone is sort of like that caution. Um, where things are getting, things are escalating either to being too silly um, or more agitated. Um, and so we need to stop and think and kind of pay attention to that. And the red zone is where things are just over the top um, and we need to stop and we need to do whatever we, uh, we need to to get out of the red zone. And so I think this is a really concrete way to begin to talk about these different states um, with, with young people and help them begin to recognize um, what that feels like in their body. And again, this can be a detective exercise. I think about this as, Developing a common language with your child, uh, it can be the, the, the focus of check-ins. So once they know what these different states represent and look like for them, how are you feeling this morning? What zone are you in? What color are you in? So um, you can kind of know what that is. And then as, uh, as you continue to work on that, um, it can get even get as detailed as, um, this is an example of just a sheet that, that outlines what different, the different zones look like for, for different um, young people. So uh, what does it feel like in your body when you're in the red zone? What is it, um, what are some of the signs that you're in the red zone? Uh, what are, and, and you can even um, add, what are some of the strategies that work well for you while you're in this zone? And so it can be a really great tool um, uh, to promote communication, but also insight uh, into um, what these different states uh, look like and in turn um, helps to lay the ground 
groundwork for building those skills. And these skills take time. This is not a magic solution, but again, it's about building those networks and pathways in the brain to develop those skills that are needed to, um, to manage this, this very complicated um, demands. And lastly, I just wanted to say that it's important to, um, to recognize that you're not alone in this and that there are many sources of support um, as you're navigating this journey. Um, many, um, many agencies have associated either behavioral therapists or behavior interventionists. Some agencies have uh, behavioral analysts, which is um, sort of a, a higher level of education um, and they do more kind of uh, in-depth analysis around, uh, around behaviors. Many of the children's at mental health agencies have individual family and group um, organization or um, uh, programming that can help. And if you go to Children's Mental Health Ontario, you can find uh, an organization that's close to you. Sometimes we, um, we request some further input from psychiatry or our colleagues in developmental pediatrics or even your pediatrician, depending on where you live. Because sometimes, uh, because of the neurobiological basis of many of these behaviors, sometimes some psychopharmacology can be helpful. Um, so some medication to actually help, um, help with the behaviors. And sometimes that creates um, a bit more space to, for, for young people to implement the strategies that they're learning. So we often do those in um, collaboration with each other. Sometimes consulting with our rehabilitation colleagues in occupational therapy or uh, physiotherapy can be helpful to identify sensory triggers or sensory motor um, uh, uh, recommendations uh, to help in that way. Um, and, I, and, and I also recommend that parents get some support for themselves, either informally through family or friends or the people that uh, they know they can talk to, but also many organizations have parent support groups, whether it's the children's rehab centers, uh, epilepsy associations, uh, hospital programs, uh, community organizations. There's lots of different places that offer parent support groups, and that can be a really nice outlet to share how you're feeling and some of the struggles you're having, but also to gain more ideas about, um, about what works well for you. Thanks very much for your time and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to that portion of the talk. Thank you for that presentation, Heather. Uh, our next presenter will be Christy Nyland Burns. Christy will be sharing her experiences as a parent. Christy? Hi, thank you. Um, I I do have some slides, but I'm going to start sharing them in a little bit. I'm going to introduce myself first. So I live on a farm in East Central Saskatchewan, and I work on the farm's management team in finance and marketing. And my real passion is policy and procedure and HR and family business relations. I teach martial arts. I've been married 25 years, and I have five kids. And our son, Sam, who was our fourth child, was diagnosed with myoclonic seizure disorder at two. So until his first seizure, he was a bright, busy boy, and he seemed developmentally completely normal. His first seizures presented as choking, and it took a long while and a video camera to be taken seriously and to begin the process of diagnosis and treatment. Um, Sam could have any of three kinds of seizures on a day, often many times a day. He had myoclonic jerks, tonic-clonic seizures, and atonic seizures. So he fell a lot. We started to wear a foam sparring helmet around our house and especially when he climbed the stairs. Uh, we tried and rejected a few seizure meds before deciding on valproic acid and levetiracetam in tandem. So they worked for the seizures but they made his behavior really unmanageable. And we found as you may have as well that seizure management was the goal of the neurologists we saw. So when we could report that the seizures had lessened and then eventually stopped, they put a check mark in Sam's file made an appointment to follow up in six months. And in the meantime, we really struggled to manage. So during an MRI at age three, Sam was also diagnosed with Chiari malformation type two. One month later, he had brain surgery to decompress the spinal fluid blockages that were beginning to form in his spine. And as a result of his brain tonsils growing into the top of his spinal column. So at the time we were told that Sam had a physical brain abnormality and an unknown seizure disorder and that they were unrelated. So we were terrified and we were skeptical, but we were not the experts. So we continued on with meds after surgery and we traveled to sick kids for a second opinion. The meds that Sam was on made him a, a zombie. He could really only handle being read to or sleeping or watching TV. When he reached age four, we really began to worry about his ability to learn and develop as he was so foggy all of the time. And we had seen definite regression in his learned skills and vocabulary. 
We started early childhood intervention preschool classes, speech pathology, occupational and physical therapy, and we were trying to combat all these issues with fine gross motor skills that showed up as a side effect of the meds. When we went to sick kids, they informed us that Sam was a good candidate to try a seizure control diet. So we signed on for a modified Atkins low glycemic index diet and slowly worked our way onto it. We even more slowly started to wean Sam's meds. At this time he was in school and he was in an extremely supportive learning environment with a full-time EA. However, he was struggling to learn, to behave, to listen to instructions and to fit in. As we weaned the levetiracetam, Sam started to become aggressive. He was ex experiencing withdrawal and we really needed to notify the school in advance about any changes in meds because he would become so difficult to manage. So I would get phone calls from the principal or the teacher because they had to physically drag him down the hall when he was losing his mind, screaming and crying. He would growl at us at home. He would refuse to listen and cooperate. He would hit his sisters. He would burst into tears for no reason. It took us almost two years to wean from his meds. Then we started weaning from the diet. So at that time, we didn't take him anywhere because he might become overexcited. He might create an unpredictable situation. We stayed home, we hunkered in, and we juggled sitters and help from family and friends to try and avoid the really public and ugly meltdowns that he would experience. At one point, I seriously considered having my son has a seizure disorder just tattooed across my forehead to combat the judgmental looks and then also whispered comments. It was a very difficult season, one marked by his sisters getting off the bus every day and urgently asking, did Sam have any seizures today? His disorder was disordering everyone's lives. We tried to make times where Sam would stay with one of his sets of grandparents overnight so we could take his four sisters out to do something fun that didn't revolve around their brother and all of his limitations. And it felt awful, but the kids and my husband and I needed it very badly. So fast forward a dozen years and my big exciting report to you is that our son remained and remains seizure free with no interventions. The hard part in all of this is that he is slow. My son is slow. And I think this is the first time I've ever said it out loud and it physically hurts. So he has done distance ed online for eight years and he's working independently. He's finishing his grade 12 year, but he's taking modified classes and he needs someone to help him manage his workload, his pace, his submissions. He can't handle the volume of work that a normal grade 12 kid would do. And he struggles cognitively. He takes longer to process. His responses are oversimplified for an adult. He misses social cues and nuances and a lot of other general things that his sisters have just grown up knowing they pull from their environment or from books or interactions or media. He needs constant reminders about his personal hygiene. So, 18 year old men smell bad if they're not taking care of themselves. He needs reminding about changing his clothes and about being aware of social norms, about grooming. He doesn't experience hot, cold, or wet, dry the way we do. And so that has led to raw feet after spending a month counseling at summer camp in wet sandals or whole loads of funky smelling laundry because he puts it away when it's not dry. We worry about frostbite and heat exhaustion when we aren't there to help him. At his last ed psych assessment, the lovely person who administered the test said it this way, she said, if you lined up 100 kids for cognitive reasoning skills performance, your son would be fifth from last. So I know that a lot of you can understand the deep, deep pain that comes from hearing those things from professionals, from holding your child while they seize, from getting bad looks at the grocery store or bad phone calls from school. And I know that you've probably had some of those same conversations with your kids that I've had about mine about social norms and deodorant and listening. And that is why I'm here today because I needed to know when we were in the thick of it that someone else got what we were going through. And as it turns out, I still need to hear that today. So I have worked really hard in these past years, painful, angry adolescent boy years to try and figure out how to relate to my son how to validate his experiences and to reward his efforts. And here's the thing, my son is an amazing person.
he is kind and sensitive and thoughtful and great with kids. He's patient and self-reflective. And I've hurt him with my expectations for normal. And with my frustration, when sometimes he just misses what I'm asking of him. I have put pressure on him to succeed, to look like his peers or his cousins or his sisters. I have asked him to be what and how he will never be. And I missed a quiet chance to grieve that and to allow him to be himself, to be Sam. So full disclaimer here, I do not have the answers on managing your child's behavior, whether it's developmental or the nature of the disorder or the side effects from meds. Everyone's story is so different and everyone's circumstances are different and everyone's supports are different. Many people are still struggling with appointments and meds and seizures and complicated diagnoses. But there is hope too, and I want to encourage you with a few practices. So if I can find. I'm trying to share my screen. Uh oh, I think I've lost it. I apologize. There we go. So, a few practices as you parent your child with a seizure disorder. My first one is to accept your child as they are. This took me a really long time, and Sam and I hurt so much because of it. Accept your child as a whole person with a complicated medical diagnosis and a lot of really crappy hard stuff that comes with that. We have had to get rid of the word normal in our house. It doesn't exist even in our healthy kids. We have five of them and they're all different and they've all had different struggles. Sam's are mainly medical in nature. But when we use the term normal and we buy into the term normal, we create this false expectation and therefore disappointment. And our kids know when we're disappointed in them because they don't add up, add up. And it hurts us and it hurts them too. So check normal and learn to love what it is and all of its messiness. My second idea is that you should allow yourself to grieve what is and what isn't. Make sure you have people in your life that give you space and permission to speak that loss aloud. And check in regularly with yourself to see how that creeps in with your interactions with your child. So if you're seeing that you're frustrated, find some space and breathe and breathe. It is a process we get better at with practice and it takes less time every time I allow myself to do it. I would say you should avoid parenting out of fear. So, so many of the times I've missed the mark as a mom, I've par parented from a deep seated sense of fear about test results or about assessments or about what other people think of my kid or what their future holds. And fear is real and it's honest, but it should not drive your parenting. It makes you controlling and aggressive and pushy. And it takes away the ability to be kind and present and loving. I would suggest that you allow yourself to cut people out if you need for a season. So in my earlier point, I encouraged you to make room for people you can be honest and real with. But if you have people in your life that expect you or your kid to look a certain way, or they hold them up to someone's standards, or to try and achieve something, you may have to take a break from those people. We had to intentionally avoid people who held our son up against his peers or made Sam or us feel lesser because he simply couldn't accomplish what other kids were accomplishing. We had to say no to time with people who were obviously uncomfortable around our kid. We surrounded ourselves instead with friends and family who loved us as we were, messy and confused and exhausted. These people honestly love our son and they honestly engage with him on his level then and now. They never made us feel like we had to explain or apologize for what he is or what he isn't. So if you have people in your life that make you feel that way, give yourself permission to take a break. I would encourage you to trust your gut. This child has been entrusted to you to care for. And if you are unsure about something that is being told about diagnosis or meds or behavior, or you feel like something is off, it might be. So journal what's going on, get a second opinion and ask for 
help when you need it. So if you are struggling and feeling like things are out of control, I sympathize with you. We journaled what was happening with seizures and meds and behavior, and it really helped to form a picture for the team we were working with. We traveled to Toronto to see a peds epileptologist at Sick Kids, and we started asking for help with the behavior stuff. We saw pediatric psychiatrists, occupational and physical and speech therapists. Sam still does twice a month OT to this day just to work on self-advocacy and for life after home skills. So after all these appointments and interactions, it helps to ease the burden just a little. My last piece of advice to you is to give yourself a lot of grace. This is hard. This child and this journey we're on is entirely unique. You will not get it right 100% of the time. That's really bad news. But you can forgive yourself when it goes badly. You can hug your kid and you can start over. Sam's personal gifts and strengths are emerging in areas that are under-acknowledged. He has a servant heart and a strong listening ear and the ability to sit with someone in tension and be present. These are not particularly lauded attributes in an 18-year-old young man. They are not academic or athletic in nature. And yet, they make him a great human and that just needs to be enough. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for sharing, Christy. Um, we will uh, now be starting the question and answer session. Just a reminder that if you have a question, please type it into the chat room at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we'll do uh, our best to get in as many questions as we can today. Um, I think. Uh, Christy, someone is asking, could you speak about your experience with the modified Atkins diet? And uh, what helped Sam become seizure-free? Was it the diet? You'll need to unmute. Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Yeah, could you speak to your experience with the modified Atkins diet? And is that what helped Sam become seizure-free? You know, we don't know and they can't tell us. And that's the delightful thing about a neurological disorder in a child. Um, the, the diet allowed us to, to go off meds and that really created a lot of clarity for Sam and helped him to be able to learn. When we moved off the diet and Sam was still seizure free, they could not specifically tell us. So we don't know if it was the surgery that created the seizures or if it was, if it was just a myoclonic epilepsy disorder and Chiari, so we're not sure. We were never actually given a lot of clarity on that. Thank you. There's uh, another question, Christy, for you. What would have been more helpful from the professionals in the time that Sam was newly diagnosed? And uh, were the epilepsy community supports involved in your story? So we live in rural Saskatchewan, which means that epilepsy supports are are quite a bit fewer than in Ontario. Um, our experience, uh, my brother works at OBI and he was such a huge support to us, uh, walking along us, um, alongside us in this journey. But I think what would have been really helpful is if where we lived, we had a team that when Sam was diagnosed, they just said, this is the deal, your kid has seizure disorder, so we're going to help the parents in this way, we're going to help the family in this way, we're going to give you material for your school, and so on. So uh, it would have been really, really helpful for us to have a bit more of a collaborative approach. We had to do an enormous amount of advocacy for our son. And it was just digging around in trial and error. Thank you. Um, I have a question for um, Mary, uh, Mary Lou. Mary Lou, uh, as kids get older, do the behavior problems get better or uh, do they more or less stay the same? Um, that's a great question, Mac. Thank you. Uh, what we have found in our own research is that over time, uh, at least parent reported uh, indices of behavior problems seem to diminish. So we do think that there is a developmental um, component. Um, in some individuals, however, there is persistence of problems throughout childhood and into adulthood. So 
there is some attenuation for at least a subset of individuals. You've uh, talked about surgery and how very often problems that have developed before surgery persist after surgery. Uh, would there be an argument for early surgery? Uh, maybe try to get the focus out before the behavior changes are uh, solidly implanted? Well, if you believe that the um, behavior problems are, are um, the result of the seizures themselves, the epilepsy themselves, then that is of itself a, a strong argument for early surgery. However, if you believe that the um, behavior disorders are another symptom of brain damage or brain dysfunction or un some underlying uh, brain impairment, then you wouldn't necessarily expect that the surgery would fix that because it's not normalizing the brain itself. It is removing the part of the, it's removing the seizure generator, but it doesn't necessarily um, remove the behavior or psychological disorder generator. Heather, um, you talked about self-regulation, uh, sort of reflecting back calm, calm breathing and calm environment. Uh, but you also talked a little bit about athletics. Um, do you think athletics help kids with, with struggling with their emotional problems? Thanks, Mike. That's a great question. I think... Um, I think athletics actually, or physical activity in general, actually has a number of benefits. I think there's a lot of research that supports uh, in physical activity uh, having really good mental health benefits. I think for um, children who have difficulties regulating, sometimes actually taking movement breaks or um, uh, burning off some of that energy can be a way to kind of help them um, to, to regulate sort of that excess um, energy. I also think for, for some children, we talked about like the idea of refueling your tank uh, and, and that kids need the fuel to be able to, to move forward and build these skills. And I think for, for some young people, uh, athletics or any type of physical activity or input that they enjoy is it, it can be something that can build their confidence and uh, can be something that gives them a boost because it's something they're good at and they may not have to, um, uh, you know, it can be really hard for kids to learn and it can be really hard for kids to behave and control themselves in the ways that we would like them to. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of different um neurobiological processes working really well together. And so um, if athletics is something that gives kids a boost of confidence and makes them feel good about themselves, I think um, that can, there can be a really um, uh, positive role for that. Here is a question from Drew, and I guess it would be addressed to all of you. Is there a way to detect whether the behavior is directly related to the seizures or whether it is related to something else? Um, Mary Lou, would you like to give that a try? Um, sure. Um, one way to begin to tackle that problem is to do what we almost call a behavior diary. And that is to try to document when the problematic behaviors occur, what they're like, but also what happened before them and what happened after them. So can you identify that whether or not there are triggers to the behavior problems, behavior um, outbursts, and whether or not there are, what, what are the consequences? Um, and by doing that, you can um, hopefully identify whether, whether there are environmental circumstances that may generate the outbursts or, um, have them uh, be, re be reinforced. And if you can't see that there's any relationship um, over time and you wanna, you know, there's been no change in seizure frequency, there's been no change in medications and so on, you need to keep track of all of these figures in order to try to map out what might be the, um, the inputs. So that would be one way to go about it. And that's what is often um, recommended. And I'm sure that that's one thing that Heather speaks to families about when she's working with them on their child's behavior. Hey, thank you. Uh, Christy, 
Uh, Mary Lou suggested that drugs could make seizure problems worse or behavior problems worse. Did you find that with Sam? We absolutely did. We actually um, started him on two seizure drugs that we discontinued partly because of aggressive behavior before we, before we um, settled on what we settled on. Uh, however, we did find that, that on his seizure, his, his working seizure drugs, he was really very zombie-like. He was just kind of out of it all of the time. Is a question for Heather. Um, when you're seeing behavioral problems in kids, What's the best place to start to get help? A, a pediatrician, a pediatric psychologist, neurologist, where, where would you go for help? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think it, it depends, uh, depends on your scenario, where you're receiving care, um, what kind of center that's, that is, and whether there's, um, uh, you know, what the resources look like. But I think, I think probably the best advice I could give is tell anyone and everyone involved in your child's care um, what's going on and what's happening. I think uh, what I can hear sometimes is that during medical appointments, it feels like things are rushed or maybe um, you know things aren't asked about. And I think going into an appointment with, uh, a, a, you know, I often will say to families, what are the things that are most important to you to talk about? Um, and today, like, what do you want to make sure we get to? Uh, but not everybody does that um, in, in appointments. And so I think going in with an agenda of these are the things that I would like to cover today, or these are things that I need to talk about, and I need to walk away with an understanding of who to turn to next, I think could be really, really useful. Um, oftentimes, a neurologist will point you to, um, to the resources within the center, um, at the center that you're in. I think pediatricians can be a great resource. I often work with developmental pediatricians, if that's, uh, if that's something that you have. Um, have available to you. And we have some amazing children's mental health resources uh, in this province. And what you might find is that you go to a children's mental health resource and they say, I'm not a neurologist. I don't know about epilepsy. And that's okay. Um, because you, you know, you have a neurologist, you're working with a neurology team, but I, I would frame the challenges that you're dealing with more in terms of the behaviors that you're seeing, because often those are things that are somewhat familiar to them and they can help you work through. So I think it's a real team approach, um, um, where different people are adding different, different pieces to, um, to the puzzle. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, question for Mary Lou. Would you recommend that all children who have epilepsy and behavior concerns have a neuropsychological assessment? And would this be beneficial for the school setting? So yes, I would recommend that. And there have been uh, many leaders in the field of epilepsy who have recommended that that be the case. In fact, some people have recommended that everybody have um, a neuro, at least a neuropsychological screening at the time that they're diagnosed with their epilepsy to establish a baseline with which to follow them over time. The problem is the availability or lack of availability of these um, services. I note that the person who put the question in the chat box says that um, in the uh, U United States, kids who have a diagnosis of epilepsy have formal neuropsychological assessments at school. We all know that in our, at least I'll speak about the Toronto area, Ontario system, the uh, wait list for um, assessments at school is years long. So it's a problem with resources. The neuropsychological assessment can be very helpful for, um, for the school for establishing the right kind of uh, program, the right um, accommodations or modifications, the right educational setting that the child might need, establishing what those supports are and, and sort of giving the family some um, some armamentarium to push the school on putting those resources in place. But the problem is um, the lack of services. Maybe a question for uh, anyone. Um, kids with behavior problems often get into trouble with schools. And talking to teachers, I know that teachers come out of teacher college with no education about epilepsy and no idea that there can be behavior problems attached to it. What would be a, a good approach for a parent to take uh, to the school system or to the teachers that the, the child is seeing? 
Can I speak to that, Mac, please? Please, please and then do. Heather, Heather will, I know, will have something to add, and, and Christy from her experience. But this is exactly the reason why we went to Eplink and said, please give us the resources to develop this teacher toolkit. It consists of a brief video um, which explains the comorbidities in terms that teachers can understand. And we um, created these handouts for the various aspects of comorbidities, providing a little bit of the research background and context and giving practical suggestions that parents can apply at home and teachers can apply at school. When we were developing these materials, we met with a group of, of teachers and focus groups and they loved them. They thought they were really helpful. So please go to the website that I put up earlier and that Rebecca put in the um, chat box. And that's something that's available uh, to everyone and spread the word. And then I know Heather will probably have something additional to uh, add to that. Very quickly, um, I, I think I, I I completely agree with Mary Lou. Those materials are excellent and I reference them um, uh, all the time uh, within my work and advocacy with schools. I think, you know, um, what I, at its very simplest, I think letting schools know and understand um, the brain-based origins of what's happening um, with, with your child, but also um, letting them know that, um, that it's not just the Caesar, Caesars themselves. I think schools can tend to be quite preoccupied with safety um, and responding to the Caesars themselves. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I hear often is, oh, well, we're not seeing seizures because the child has seizures at night or the seizures are very small, they're very brief. And what we know is that um, there's far more going on in between seizures, abnormal electrical activity, if there's abnormal brain ranges. And so I think that education can be really, really helpful for schools to understand that this is far deeper than just the seizures themselves causing kind of people think about seizures causing, you know, an interruption in learning in the moment, which of course they do um, or have the potential to, but it's, it's far exceeds that. And I think those materials Materials that Mary Lou referenced really speak nicely um, to all of these other um, aspects. And the one other thing I would say is that it's really important for, to develop open communication with the school where they are keeping you updated on things that they're uh, observing on an ongoing basis. So you, you have that data to be able to go to your neurologist or request a psychology referral. Um, those kinds of things can be uh, really useful. Christy, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'm not sure what, what it's like in Ontario. Are we we had an amazing school system and a school team, but we would include everyone. And so we would have a meeting with the resource teacher, any of the support staff was getting it at school, his teacher and the principal, so that if it showed up anywhere else on the playground or other places, um, everybody was on the same page. And I think that that's really, really key is just always keeping all of the main actors in the loop. Okay, um, we have run our hour. I would just like to say thank you to Rebecca Welfley and everyone who worked on this, uh, this session. Thanks to Eplink and thanks to the OBI for making Eplink possible. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we would love to have your feedback about this event. There is a survey found in the link in the chat box uh, and this link will be mailed out to you after the, uh, after the meeting today. And I see that Rebecca has also added, uh, pardon me, has added the link to the teacher's kit at this point. Uh, we, Rebecca, anything you'd like to say to end off? I just wanted to thank um, all the speakers and, and Matthew as well for moderating and for everyone for attending today. Thanks so much. Thank you all. And uh, we hope it was beneficial. Have a good afternoon.